Hi and welcome to the Zoo Let Volvo Cars presentation. We are members of Team CI. I'm Johannes Fufas, product owner. And I'm Alvin Voss, CI DevOps and our main contributor to the Zool open source project. So how are you running Zool? Well, we mo mostly have a small core team. Uh, there was a team that started out using CI in our organization. Uh, we're hosting the Zool backend and all our cloud nodes and static nodes. Um, but over time we've grown to support about 111 developers and uh, these are a lot of small teams that we support. So to ease our workload we've tried to uh, educate some of them to be able to add nodes, pipelines, repos or job configurations. So why are we running Zool then? Well, premium cars need premium tools and Zool is a premium tool. Uh, for always having a green master, we can increase our development speed. And this we have seen in actuality when we started using Zool. And one example of something built with Zool is the one pedal drive feature of Polestar 2. This was built with Zool. And there's a link here in the presentation if you want to look into that feature. So our history then. Uh, our team uh, stems from a team that started to, around year 2000 with in-house software development. And uh, at that time, they used uh, local computers with bat files and uh, passed around USB sticks between them to get the code and test it. Around 2015, we started using Jenkins and nightly builds. And the uh, following year, uh, we ramped up to around 100 developers uh, in that system. And we experienced a lot of pain, integration hell, I would say. Every time there was a deadline, somebody threw in a wrench and uh, destroyed the ability to compile and build software. And we had to default, debug that and find a problem. So we searched the internet for some kind of gating system that will keep master green. And we stumbled upon Zool and we introduced Zool version 2, 2018. And uh, 2019, we started experimenting with Zool version 3. And um, yeah. yeah, and that's where we started migrating all our projects to Zool V3. And uh, all new projects we started up uh, always used Zool V3. And around the 2020, uh, early 2020, everything was running Zool V3. Yeah. So why Zool version 3 then? Well, uh, we needed to handle uh, software development in an NVIDIA central computer. But there are many teams with different gearheads and we have the introduction of cloud nodes. Uh, so here we really rely on the cross-product dependency feature of Zool because the complexity increased a lot. And as mentioned before, the most important feature of Zool is its gating system. Do not merge broken code. <laughs> this is really important, actually. So our longest Zool project has had a green master since April 2018, while other non-Zool teams at our company had long periods of broken master tracks and even turned off CI in periods. Uh, there are other features that we love with Zool, and one is the speculative merge. And uh, here, when we have a deadline, uh, the waiting time to, for a developer to see their software change to merge to master is actually how many nodes we can provide and how many licenses. And then we test everything in parallel, if possible. We also have a system of prioritized queues that we really like. So in the same scenario, when there is a deadline, we don't want somebody to throw in 200 uh, developer-defined jobs when there is an important uh, uh, deadline. Then we want to prioritize. I mean, we want things to merge to master then. Uh, and then CI job configuration together with the software in the repository. This is really important. Yeah, and this comes from a requirement that we always have to be able to reproduce jobs, sometimes even years down the road. And even though we really like Zool and we think it's great in many ways, uh, we've also encountered a lot of problems with it, uh, mostly when coming from Jenkins uh, and the Windows side of it. Uh, and most of these problems um, do not stem from uh, us running on Windows itself, but uh, it comes from uh, the software we use to build our so software in the automotive industry. And uh, these build tools are, are often expected to run in a desktop environment. And this is not how uh, Ansible connects to a working machine, since it's uh, starting up a headless environment. So we've had to uh, build a lot of hacks to work around these limitations to get our tools working on the machines. 
And since uh, we're supporting a lot of small teams with their own Gavit instances, or rather Git code review systems, uh, it means that when we onboard a new team, we need to add a new connection to that Git review system. And then we need to reboot. And a reboot takes too long currently, since some of our projects are really big. We have projects up to five gigabytes in size with uh, way too many branches that need to be merged. And uh, another uh, problem we have is that the scheduler is a, currently a single point of failure, which means that if for some reason the scheduler stops working or the node it's running on uh, crashes, uh, our entire CI infrastructure is down, which causes a lot of developers to not being able to work. So the software components build with Zool. Uh, I think a lot of these components mentioned here in this list are actually involved in a nice video we had in the beginning of this presentation. Uh, we have some uh, autonomous drive components. Uh, at the moment, uh, these are high-level ones. Uh, decision management, uh, operation management, uh, bliss warning system, and so forth. Uh, we have the propulsion vehicle control, which controls uh, the handling of the car connected to the gas pedal, for instance, how the car feels. We have the uh, dependability of that, which is the security-based systems and the fallback strategies. We have thermal control, which handles and the cooling systems of the car and everything connected to that. I mean, an electric car needs a lot of cooling with its electrical batteries and motors. Uh, we have vehicle state, which calculates accelerations and uh, with different kind of sensors in the car. Uh, vehicle stationary control. We have uh, vehicle manual lateral control. Brake planning. Uh, if you have an electric car, you can brake with an electric motor and you can brake with the friction brakes, so you need to blend those. Uh, we have important things inside the cabin, uh, door control, seat control, and cabin climate control. And then we have steering control. And we have the central onboard diagnostic core. So we actually have the diagnostics of the whole car um, developed with Zoom. Uh, and we also have a central computer low power CPUs, a base technology. Uh, and this team uh, really likes uh, likes Zool, and they develop their code in Rust, which is really exciting. Yeah, and they really like to preach how well suited Rust is for the automotive industry, since it uh, tries to be uh, safe by uh, safe with the memory handling by default. Yeah, and we actually uh, just a week ago we admitted one of these uh, team members to the backend, so they have backend access to Zool. So they're uh, that's really nice. I would say. Here is an example of some pipelines. Uh, these are the YAML files from one of the repositories. And here we have a MATLAB simulating target link generated C code uh, pipeline. And the first thing that we have run here is uh, build avoidance. So we have one team member who wrote this one morning. And this saves us a lot of time because we analyze the file structure, we analyze what kind of change we have, and then we just run the necessary jobs for that change. Yeah, and this means that all the jobs below the build avoidance job is always dependent on the build avoidance job. Yeah, and if they are not run, they turn up as skipped in the Zool dev GUI. Uh, and we also uh, run different things here in checking gate, and uh, in gate we run target compilers and we run mm -hmm. smoke tests or merge tests as we call them to ensure that the system is working actually. Here is another example, another pipeline. This, these are samples from the Rust Teams pipelines. And here you, they run uh, processor and loop tests. They have raspberries that they run Rust code on in. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think they run more or less things you would expect from them. I mean, running cargo and so on. Uh, so here's this list. In this picture, uh, we try to paint uh, a schematic flow of uh, the whole complete uh, pipeline, as so how they could see. The white dots are automatic jobs, and the uh, flat capacitators are manual steps, like Garrett code review, for instance. Uh, in the left section, uh, we have a flow that describes uh, code generated with MATLAB, uh, Simulink, or TargetLink. And uh, here we have a lot of tools uh, that we run. For instance, we run complexity analysis, we run a lot of check scripts, 
Uh, we run uh, cross compilers and we build DLLs in a Windows environment and unit tests. We run CPC check uh, and signal consistency, for instance. And this is mainly because we have uh, critical sensitive uh, software that's uh, software that uh, are safety related and cannot. Yeah, and this left side also comes from us supporting uh, model developers who are not programmers in nature. Yeah, not all of them at least. Some are. And uh, on the right, right side, we have a pipeline uh, that uh, you, from software developers that write uh, code by hand. So this would naturally look different. It could be C, C++, or even Rust. And uh, we see here the check and the gate. And um, you leave, uh, you enter gate by the product owner usually uh, doing a code review plus two. And here well, then we would run the compilers and make sure the run system tests to ensure that the system actually works. And then we have a start to release pipeline by building, a, creating a git tag, and that would create change logs and the documentations. And uh, sometimes we also build the target uh, software, I mean, on retarget and test it there in a little rig. And in this picture, you can see some of the tools that we use uh, in these pipelines. And on the MATLAB uh, section, you can see that we use uh, MXRA and MXAM from MES. Uh, we use Silver and Test Viewers and from Synopsys in order to test our software, uh, hardware independent. And uh, you can also see some of the target compilers that we have in Gates here. So Currently, we're hosting all of our SUL components on static nodes that we got, got them from an IT department. And that means we, we're not able to start and stop this at will. We're not able to uh, register new nodes or things like that. So we have a set amount of nodes that we're running on. Um, but uh, recently, we got access to uh, AWS. So we're starting to use cloud nodes for build jobs and things like that as well. Uh, we're also using Artifactory for all of our binaries that we generate uh, during the job. Uh, but our current main focus is uh, moving our SOOL components to cloud. And this is part of our future. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, setting up uh, our SOOL infrastructure in uh, Kubernetes. Um, so we're going to run the scheduler and all the executors and things like that. Uh, try to have a scalability of this since a lot of our developers that we support are located here in Gothenburg. That means that during the night when everyone sleeps, we're not using our resources, but they're still running, so we're still paying for them. So scalability would be a great uh, way to uh, solve this. And we also have access to Azure, so we're going to use Azure a lot in the future, we believe. And uh, some of our users are using GitLab, so we want to be able to listen to GitLab repositories as well. User feedback then. Well, some developers were first skeptical, but especially those who work with other CI systems became highly appreciative when uh, master is not broken. Uh, some still miss uh, Jenkins graphical user interface, and uh, or a few, not many at all, uh, don't like Ansible. Yeah. And uh, the part of this Jenkins GUI is that we still have jobs that we want to run with parameters and that SUL does not support this currently. Yeah. So that's done. Thank you very much.